Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing part 108 of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights where we take a look at some of the wonderful mods people be making and use them to talk about some of the wonderful biodiversity that we share our world with. So I know this one's kind of been a long time coming but uh, I've been having issues with Planet Zoo like the videos, not been able to edit them and um, getting like corrupted so... I put it off a bit, but now since the new update's coming, I'm not going to put it off anymore. So let's get going. We've got to start off today. We're going to start off with some reptiles. We're going to start, first start off with done by Leaf and Mega Game and Rex. We have got the uh, Cayman Lizard. So really, really nice animal got going on here. So this is the Cayman Lizard or the Northern Cayman Lizard. So these guys are a lizard that are closely related to the Tegu, which people all love Tegus. And um, they have this large, heavy set body with powerful limbs. And they've got also these quite heavily muscled jaws, which they use to um, bite through like the shells of crawfish, snails, and freshwater clams. And you can see their coloration is kind of that bright red head and the uh, green body. And they also uh, get their name, the Cayman Lizard, because they very much look like a Cayman. Uh, because they have those scoots that look very much like the osteoderms of a um, caiman, which is quite interesting. And also have that long flatter tail like a caiman. And one thing as well to help these guys survive is these guys also have a uh, third membrane or an eyelid, like a nictating membrane that allows them to cover their eyes when they swim. So basically they have a pair of goggles underwater. So, in terms of size, these lizards get about 4 foot, or about 1.2 meters long, and about 4.5 kilograms, or about 10 pounds. And in terms of their distribution and habitat, these guys can be found in South American countries such as Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, uh, Peru and the Guianas, especially for the northern species, where they live in swampy or wooded habitats that are flooded. And they are mostly aquatic and can be quite excellent climbers, so they spend most of the time basking on branches overhead of water, but they will be able to flee from predators and just dive into the water when they want, which is pretty interesting. The wild population is unknown, but uh, they are considered least concern, and there's been yet to... Uh, People have been yet to really study them in their natural habitat. And uh, much of what we know comes from captive animals and zoos. So that shows how important zoos can be. And uh, this species uh, was heavily hunted for their hides. But in the 1970s, they were protected. And then the export of their skins basically dropped. So now local populations are safe where, they, where the habitat is protected. And also captive farms have been set up to help breed them for the leather trade. So it's more sustainable that way. Though a, num a number of recent years, a lot of these guys have also been found in the pet trade because people want to have them as pets. So in terms of the habits, these guys spend most of the time in or near water and at night they'll hide in trees and bushes. And in the wild, they'll feed on a variety of aquatic prey such as fish, uh, amphibians, crabs, crawfish, and those animals like that. However, they do really like snails. And uh, uh, one they do, they smash it in their jaws and then they spit out the shell and uh, then they'll slide it to the back of their mouth, crush it with their teeth, and then spit out the shell and eat it. And they've actually been known to even eat uh, Amazon river turtles by crossing their shells and then eating the softer bits chunk by chunk. And they'll also eat rodents. And they've also been known to burrow like their relative to Tegu. So they have been kept in captivity, but due to their natural diet being almost purely of snails, most wild caught adults will refuse to eat anything. So some zoos and aquariums had has some success breeding them. And people that farm them, because they're a little bit, uh, they're basically captive born, they're a little bit easier and more easier to accept foods, more willing to eat different foods. That helps uh, in captivity, that really helps. But in terms of their habitat, they need a large tank or pool and need a place to dig and logs to climb on and bask on, which can be quite hard to uh, accommodate for a big lizard like this. Remember, they get four feet long, so they need a large enclosure. So most people don't really have a lizard like this. But that being said, uh, they are quite intelligent and they're able to, um, like, people can get used to them and train them, which is quite cool, and solve problems, things like that, and um, quite smart, so that's quite cool. And one zoo in Switzerland, uh, Basile, has managed to breed these guys, so there is some success happening. So really, really cool animals. Again, done by Leaf and uh, Mega Gammon Rex, another really cool animal. So next up, we've got another one. So we have got, moving on to crocodiles, we have got the Orinoco crocodile, chilling out here. 
So the Orinoco crocodile. These guys are a critically endangered species of crocodile, which sucks. Uh, their population now is very small, and they can only be found in the Okinawa River in Colombia and Venezuela. So, um, in terms of characteristics, they've got a relatively long snout, as you see there, which is narrower than the somewhat similar-looking American crocodile. And they generally have a pale hide with some color variations, with some being yellowish and some being dark brownish gray, with the skins being able to change over a long period of time, as they can generally change the, uh, over time, change the amount of melanin in their skin. And um, they've got these dark brown markings to them, which are more pronounced bands on younger specimens. And in terms of size, these guys are among the largest living reptiles, as well as the largest predator in the Americas. Um, Oh, the wild bigger than uh, on average uh, much bigger at least longer than like American alligators and black caimans things like that So given their maximum size so sexual maturity they're kind of the fourth largest or, or longest crocodilian So that's the Orinoco then it's Gariel uh, Nile crocodile and saltwater crocodile being the longest so sexual maturity for um, crocodiles Orinoco crocodiles is attained at about two and a half meters or about eight feet long and seem to be 93 kilograms and for males, it's about uh, 3.65, about 12 feet long. And they may attain lengths of up to about 15 feet long, or about 3.65, or about 4.1 to 4.8 meters throughout their life. With some big specimens getting up to about 650 kilograms, or about 1,400 pounds. Though most specimens now, remember this is uh, historically, and um, those large specimens are usually hunted out of the population. So on average, the average ones are much smaller, because those would be old crocodilians. So yeah, decent size, again, fourth largest. So um, in terms of habitat, these guys are now restricted in the Okinawa River Basin in Colombia and Venezuela, but they've been occasionally reported in Trinidad, but they've not been confirmed, and witnesses have mistaken them for American crocodiles. But they were once thought to be much more widespread and live in a wide variety of habitats, from the streams of the At uh, Andes foothills and uh, tropical forests, but now they're restricted to the Lenaus savanna and seasonal freshwater, things like that. So even though they are critically endangered and there's a lot of efforts to go in to protect them, not really much is too known about them. So there's been little study on dietary behavior, but it seems these guys, a majority eat large fish, where they have relatively narrow snouts to be able to better catch fish. So like a least specialized gharial. They're also opportunist, opportunistic apex predators, so they will go for anything that's big enough. So invertebrates, uh, reptiles, birds, mammals, anything they can get their mouths around, they're quite generalist. And they've been known to stalk both aquatic and terrestrial prey, and as large adults can feed on domestic animals, other large predators, monkeys, deers, birds, things like that, and even potentially eat like common caimans and cannibalize smaller uh, Orinoco crocodiles. Though attacks on crocodiles have, I mean, attacks on people have been reported, it's uncommon behavior, and given their very small population isolation, it's very unlikely that you're going to get attacked by one of these crocodiles. A small, a small number of attacks have been uh, documented. A second, like, um, survivor, there's been a small number of fatal attacks, about two to three people uh, per year were killed by, or by these crocodiles like in about in 1800s but there have been a few attacks like the most recent one 2011 survived a attack from a crocodile but details are actually lacking quite a bit so next we're going to talk about their reproduction so where are these little guys because we've got some babies in here there's a baby cute little baby little baby 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 having a sleep so very similar to other species of crocodiles these guys will uh breed in the dry season where they will build their burrows on the riverbanks and the adult uh, pair mates during that dry period and then the female will often outnumber the males in their territories and um, usually after 14 weeks of after the mate they will go and make their nests and lay about 40 eggs and they are a hole nester like all crocodilians so they'll build a dig a hole and fill it up with rotting vegetation and they will guard that vegetation with the eggs inside for about three months and um, during the night, the youngs will actually hatch and call to the mother, and she digs them out. And they are quite vulnerable, especially young uh, crocodiles. They are uh, vulnerable to tegus, anacondas, caimans, jaguars, carnivores, and um, carnivores like that. So, though they are sometimes caught and killed by the defending mother crocodile, so uh, they're very fierce uh, mothers. Well, adults typically have no predators except for humans, and then females will actually defend these pods of juveniles for over three years. For uh, and though they will get to one year independence, it's generally more common. And a study shows that uh, Orinoco crocodiles, the aggressive behavior of adults 
wild nesting is shown to be that even normally um, docile crocodiles that, that are used to people and not too aggravated will get really, really aggressive and um, attack whatever comes close to the nest when they're brooding. Uh, and with without prosecution, it's believed that these guys could live quite a long time, about 70 to 80 years, which is quite comparable to other crocodiles. Let's have a look at the female while we're um, talking about these guys. So, as I mentioned, the Orinoco crocodile is sadly highly endangered, and that is due to excessive hunting for its hide. Throughout the 1940s and six, to the 60s, thousands of animals were killed and were pretty much nearly uh, threatened with extinction. Today, they have been given protective status around the 1970s, but their populations have yet to recover to that stage. And um, there's also been things like selling juveniles for the live animal trade, pollution's been another big issue, and a dam in the upper Okonora River region has been uh, suggested as a way why they haven't been recovering. Also, the increased population of spectacle caimans, uh, which is another thing as well. Though it's unclear how many individuals survive, there's been estimated range between 250 to 1500 animals uh, alive, with the largest subpopulation with fewer than 500 adults, with some other smaller populations existing. But luckily, there are um, some held in zoos and people trying to breed them and release them into uh, like private ranchlands, things like that. So there are efforts to protect the Orinoco crocodile, which is always really cool. We do love our crocodiles. So yeah, really, really awesome. Uh, this one was done by Inconutu, or, or Inconuti, Incognuto, Incognuto, that's what it is, and uh, Leaf. So another one, uh, another great reptile mod, and now we'll be moving on to some birds. So next up, this was done by Narwaller, Ron May Ron, or Rihanna, and Frazzle64. We have got the California quail. So this is a really nice one here. So... The California quail, also known as the valley quail, or just the California valley quail. These guys are a small, ground-dwelling bird from the New World, and um, they have this uh, really nice plume on them. That's, uh, that's what it's called, or a curving crest. It's made of six feathers that droop forwards. It's black in males, and females have a brown one, as you can kind of see there. And um, males will have that black cap with a um, dark brown cap and black face. With that grey body with female birds, as we can see, they are being much more greyish and more immature. This is a juvenile. Let's go find a female. Let's see if we can... All juveniles. Yeah, this is an adult, so you can see a little bit modelled pattern there, but really, really cool. And the closest relative, the Gambles quail, is lives more south, and these guys have brighter heads, things like that. Um, in terms of behavior, these guys are quite highly sociable birds, and they often gather in small flocks called of, um, conveys. And one of their daily communal activities is often like a little dust bath. And um, when a group of uh, quail select an area where the ground has been newly turned off or soft, they'll use the underbellies and burrow downwards and... and to kind of shake off the soil and get a little bit of dust bath in, which helps get rid of a lot of things within their feathers and things like that. And then they flap their wings. They seem to prefer doing this in sunny places where they can create them. And an ornithologist is able to detect the presence of quails in area by finding these dentitions, which are sometimes like 7 to 15 centimeters in diameter, which is quite cool. And they are typically year-round residents of where they live. And all of these birds coexist well on the edges of um, urban areas. It is declining in some areas because of humans. And they were originally um, found mainly in the southwestern United States, but have been introduced to places such as British Columbia, Hawaii, Chile, Brazil, Argentina, Peru, South Africa, New Zealand, and the Norfolk and King Islands of uh, Australia. And these birds will typically forage on the ground and scraping for seeds uh, in the soil. And um, they've sometimes been seen feeding on the side of roads where they find seeds and leaves, but they will also sometimes eat berries and insects. And for example, the toyon berries are a great food source for these guys. And if startled, these guys can fly, but they tend to prefer walking around the ground. They call it flushing. So they will fly up and try and get away, but normally they will get away on fit. They don't really like um, flying too much. Let's have a look at the babies while we talk about reproduction. Let's see these little guys. Little, little men's. So, in terms of their breeding habits, these guys typically like to breed in shrubby or open wooden areas in Western North America. Um, their nest is a shallow uh, scrape lined with vegetation, with the ground beneath it, uh, shrub cover and things like that. With the female usually laying up to 12 eggs, 
And once hatched, these young will associate with both uh, both adults. And once these groups are formed, they're called multifamily communal broods, which include at least two females, multiple males, and many offspring. So these groups will kind of hang around, do their things. Males actually will associate with families where they're not always a genetic father. And in good years, females will actually lay more than one clutch and le le leaving the hatching young to be with associated males and laying a new clutch out with a different male. So if, if it's a good year, they'll make multiple clutches. And they have a variety of vocalizations that include the social Chicago call, including pips and warning pips. And during the breeding season, males will make a squill, which often be interpreted with the social mate's Chicago call and have this like antiphonal call, which is quite cool. So yeah, another cool species, least concern, quite common. Again, made by Narwhaler, Ron May Ron, and uh, Frazzle64. So, um, really awesome. Next up, we're moving to another bird. Who can you now? Can you not love these birds? We have got the blue footed booby done by Leaf and Jen. So, the blue footed booby, as you can see here, is a native marine bird. These guys are native to the subtropical and tropical regions of the eastern Pacific Ocean. And um, these guys, you can see, they're about 81 centimeters uh, in length. Uh, and about one and a half kilograms or about three and a half pounds with females being on average slightly larger than males they have long pointed wings and they have like a brown back and then a light underside and face with these blue uh, heads and also these quite bright blue feet as well they've also got forward facing eyes that allow them to have great binocular vision which is really helpful for um how they hunt and um and these guys are still quite cool. They typically prey on fish by diving headlong into the water and where their nostrils are actually permanently closed and um, they are able to breathe through the corners of their mouths. And one of the most notable characteristics is these uh, blue feet that they've got, which is often a way that they use to signal for uh, mates. And um, they can range in color with that, with usually males and younger birds having lighter feet than the females, which is quite interesting. In terms of distribution, these guys can be found across most of the continental coast of the eastern Pacific Ocean from California into the Galapagos. And there is a separate subspecies that lives in the Galapagos, which is slightly bigger. They are strictly a marine bird and they only hang out on land to breed um, very young, which they usually do along rocky coasts. So a booby may actually defend two or three uh, nesting sites, which usually is on black uh, bare back lava or small divots in the ground and things like that. And usually they'll develop a preference over a couple of weeks and usually lay their eggs. And then their nests usually create in these quite large colonies. And when nesting, the female will turn to face the sun throughout the day. So the nest is surrounded in excrement. So uh, natal, how babies will uh, move around. So let's have a look at the cute little babies here. So these cute little babies, uh, the females will breed about uh, when they're one to six years old, but the males will start breeding between two and six years old. And there's very little natal uh, dispersal um, occurred. So young pairs do not really move far from their original nests after their first reproduction. And that leads to these really dense uh, congregations of boobies. And um, it's believed that this limited dispersal to staying close is more likely to have a high quality nest. And since the parents have successfully raised chicks of reproductive age, their nest must be effective. It also protects from predation and parasitism because there's so many of them, it's kind of hard to go and catch something like that. And um, bigamy has also been observed with the species where uh, two females and one male will all share a single nest or things like that. Um, one thing about really interesting about their foot pigmentation is very similar to flamingos. This is from carotenoids. So this comes from the diet of fish that they eat, so that's what makes it pink. And it's also used by antioxidants, and that stimulates their immune system. So it's basically saying, hey, I've got a good immune system. Please have babies with me. That's what those little feet says. And typically, females like to uh, females will tend to mate with younger males with brighter feet, and they also because they also have fire fertility as well, which is quite interesting. And males will often assess their uh, re mate's reproductive value and adjust their own investment to the brood according to their partner's condition. So females that lay larger and brighter eggs uh, will be more attractive to males and have greater reproductive value, while females just like to look at your feet. So basically you could say that female blue-footed boobies have a foot fetish and you cannot change my mind because that is funny. <laughs> but yeah, really, really fun. Um, in terms of their breeding and behavior though, the blue-footed booby is a specialized fish eater where they feed on small shoaling fish such as uh, sardines, anchovies, mackerels, and flying fish. They'll often take squid and offal as well, and they will often dive into the ocean to catch their prey. That's why they have binocular eyes. Uh, 
and they also will die from a great height and they'll even hunt singly pairs or in large groups as well so plunge divings can be done from heights from 10 to 30 meters and even up to 100 meters but they'll hit the water about 97 kilometers an hour or about 27 miles per hour and go as deep as 80 feet or about 25 meters to try and catch something with their skull actually having specialized air sacs that allow them to deal with that pressure uh, as they hit, um, dive and in terms of uh individuals they'll often have their own uh, hunting group things like that but they prefer to hunt usually in early morning or late afternoon with females and males actually uh, fishing differently the males are smaller and they have a proportionally longer tail and that allows them to fish in shallow areas and deep waters while the females are larger and carry more food and this allows them to uh, and they both go back to feed the chick so in terms of breeding these guys are monogamous and they also have to be bigonogamous so they're opportunistic breeders and they breed every eight to nine months or so the courtship of uh the blue-footed booty uh booby actually shows them dancing things like that and they try to impress the female with the male showing his feet and strutting and stuff in front of her and they often use like sky pointing where they point their head up to kind of say hey look at me look at me in terms of rearing young they're actually one of the two sp of species of booby that raise more than one chick in a breeding cycle and they'll lay two to three eggs about four to five days apart and um, both male and females will take turns incubating this egg with non-sitting bird keeping watch and since the blue footed booby does not have a brooding patch they usually use their feet to keep them warm the incubation periods typically about 41 to 45 days with these ha eggs hatching about one to two eggs with males and females sharing parenting responsibilities both taking care of the babies getting food for them things like that and like other sexually um uh, sized morphic birds Female blue-footed boobies prefer, usually favor the smaller sex during times of food scarcity. So um, if there's not a lot of food, they'll make a lot of males. If there's lots of food, they'll have females, things like that. And um, they'll basically allocate the resources to the one that's most likely to survive. And um, fledglings are more likely to become reproductive uh, adults when one parent is old and the other is young. And the reason for this is unknown, but nesting with different age parents are least, are least infected by ticks. That's quite interesting. And... Um, there's also records of like sibilicides, so sometimes uh, if there's not enough condition, best enough conditions, they'll kill each other, things like that. But um, yeah, really, really cool. In terms of communication, uh, these guys also make a lot of grunts and shouts with their whistling noises to communicate with each other, especially during those ritualistic displays. And males can actually reach, recognize each other by their calls, and all calls are different from sex, unique individual signatures were present. And both male and females can discriminate from their mates from others. So basically they can tell each other apart, which is kind of weird not to expect them to. But sadly, there have been some population declines, declines in these guys. I believe they are least concerned at the moment, but in the Galapagos there has been some declines. Uh, it seems to be uh, having trouble breeding and they're slowly declining. So it's not something that's happening right away. It's a slow decline that people are slightly worried about. So food problems have been observed, so believe that there's a uh, decline in sardines around um, the uh, Espanola Islands and the Galapagos. And it's basically uh, the blue-footed booby blue -footed boobies pretty much only eat these sardines, so it's been issues. And they've largely been absent from uh, the islands or the area from 1997, uh, which is shown by the Nazar boobies there, and in which they also prefer sardines. Uh, so there have been um, efforts to try and like reintroduce them, but there's also been other explanations for the decline, such as humans, diseases, and introduced predators. But yeah, really, really cool species. Luckily, still doing okay most of the part. So really, really cool. Done by Jeef, uh, no, I was going Jeef, Leaf and Jen. <laughs> Maybe I'm just talking weird. Next up, this one is done by Leaf. We have got the uh, Kodiak Red Fox. So these guys are a close, they're a subspecies of the red fox. Same ecology, same everything. They tend to hang around, um, uh, eat omnivores, uh, live in uh, pairs. They're, um, as, as I mentioned, omnivores. Same pretty much behavior. But what really makes them distinct is that they are lived on the Kodiak Islands, which are famous for having like Kodiak bears, things like that. So they will live in those areas and they're quite cold as well so they have big bushy uh coats to help keep uh, help keep warm and um typically one of the things that distinguish the red fox from other fox species is that they also have several color morphs that appear in coastal, uh, coastal regions the sub uh, the subspecies name for this subspecies is vulpus vulpus how many and they're quite large with a huge tail and coarse fur and most cardiac red foxes are either cross foxes with a brown or black uh, coat 
and they're back on their shoulders or they're red in coloration. And silver fox actually make up a smaller percentage of the population and they usually have that striking uh, silver coat, which is quite interesting. So um, they're usually in Alaska. These guys will breed around uh, uh, April and uh, February and March in Alaska. So that's when they typically breed. Uh, right after mating, the female will make one or more den and this is where she'll have her pups uh, or kits. Uh, these kits are usually born about uh, usually about 13 litters have been reported. Uh, I mean, 13 kits have been reported, but the average litter is about 10 kits. I mean, not 10 kits, uh, four kits, and usually born at about four ounces or 113 grams. Where the mother will help uh, sit, uh, thermoregulate them because they can't control the body temperature yet. She'll sit with them, keep them warm, feed them milk until their eyes open, and then she'll obviously go out and grab them food, things like that. In Alaska, in terms of what these guys will eat, uh, the um, Kodiak red fox will often eat things like uh, uh, fruits and vegetables and uh, vegetation, insects, birds, small mammals, things like that. On Kodiak itself, these guys are commonly seen on beaches eating like sea urchins and other invertebrates and digging up worms, where they are also crepuscular, so they come out in dawn and dusk, but they may be active all the time. And actually, in Kodiak, they're actually most uh, uh, visible on the beaches during the morning and evening low tides, where they're hunting voles and stuff like that. So really, really cool. So yeah, I really do like these guys. Really nice uh, mod. Also done by Leaf. Really, really good. So next up, we have got the Spotted Seal. Also done by Leaf. Uh, let's have a little look at you. Little, little, little friends. Let's see if you can find one swimming. Is there one swimming? Yes, there is one swimming. So the Spotted Seal, also known as the Lager Seal, is a... Uh, Seal that lives in the North Pacific Ocean and adjacent seas where they live in ice flows. They're typically found in the continental shelf around uh, the Bering, Oskorsk, and Chiriki seas, and sometimes found in the uh, Yellow Sea, and it's been found as far south as uh, the Western Sea of Japan. It also be found in Alaska as well, which is quite interesting. You see, if you've seen those videos of like Japanese aquariums with those um, little seals that like to uh, go up in little uh, little round orbs, that's this is the species, the spotted seals. So in terms of their size, these guys are kind of in the middle in terms of seal size. Uh, they generally get between 180 to 240 pounds and as adults, about 81 to 109, 89 to 101 kilograms. Uh, and measure about 4.5 to 6.8 feet, so 1.5 to 2.1 meters. So they're roughly the same size as a harbor or ribbon seal. And their head, as you can see, is quite round with a narrow snout that looks a lot like that of a dog's. And they also see they've got a relatively small body with uh, short flippers with uh, exceeding behind their body that thrust and allow them to act as rudders. And they've got this dense fur that varies from dark gray to white um, and to gray and silver. And has these dark irregular spots giving them their name. And males and females differ little in size and shape. So they're pretty much about the same. Males may be a little bit bigger. And in parts where their habitats overlap, they can be confused with things like harbor seals and things like that. So in terms of their habitat, these guys like to live in Antarctic and subantarctic waters, often on outer areas of ice flows during the breeding season, but they tend not to live in areas with dense drift ice during the summer months and live in the open ocean and nearby shores, places such as that. Um, spotted seals, there's been separated by three populations. There's the Bering Sea population, that includes about 100,000 seals that live in the western Bering Sea, near Kamatsha in the Gulf of Mimun, Russia as well, and in the eastern Bering Sea. There's also another population of about 100,000 seals living in the uh, Sea of Japan and the Sea of Okhotsk, and the third one living in Liaolang Bay, China, and the Peter of the Great Bay in Russia, and with some other smaller populations hanging around like South Korea, things like that, they like to hang out. So in terms of reproduction, these guys, uh, let's have a look at the babies while we talk about reproduction. These guys are relatively shy and it can be quite difficult for humans to approach them. They can be solitary but uh, in general, but they are gregarious and tend to haul out together during pumping and molting seasons, or they haul out on ice flows uh, or on land, which is, and they'll let, um, they'll, uh, I can't even speak properly now. They will gather in groups that are like thousands uh, big, when they uh, come to these rookeries, things like that. 
They typically reach sexual maturity about four years of age, and January to mid-April is the breeding season, with uh, pup births peak within mid-March, and spotted seals actually believed to be annually monogamous, and during the breeding season they will form families of up to a, of a male and female and their pup, and after a, after a 10 month gestation period, which is quite cute. And um, average birth size is about three feet or about one meter, about 26 pounds. Uh, and pups are typically weaned after about six weeks. And the maximum lifespan for a spotted seal is about 35 years old, with a few living beyond 25. Um, so typically, they can live up to 35 years old, but there's not going to be many living up to there. They average about 25. Including some of their like ecology, these guys are deep divers. They can dive up to about 300 meters or about 1,000 feet, and they feed on a wide variety of prey. Juveniles will typically feed on krill and small crustacean, but adults will feed on a lot of fish, such as herring, arctic cod, uh, pollock, and capelin. And they do not seem to vocalize a lot, and although not much is actually known about their vocalizations. So that's also interesting. And um, they appear to vocalize when they're more in molting groups as well, and when approached in these groups, they make various sounds such as groans, barks, moans, and roars. And um, based on satellite tracking conducted by a population in the Yellow Sea, they seals will migrate more than 3,300 uh, kilometers around different areas. So that's also quite interesting. I want to see the one diving. There we are. I want to see one diving. Let's move over there. So um, in terms of their conservation status, they are listed under the Endangered Species Act uh, by the U.S. Uh, National uh, or NOAA, so National Oceanographic or um, Atmospheric Administration. And after an 18-month period, there were uh, two of the three populations, especially the one adjacent, are not in danger of becoming extinct, nor are they likely to become extinct in the foreseeable future. Though climate change is definitely going to affect these guys, which is kind of sad. Uh, they also cause a loss in Arctic sea ice, which would be an issue. You do not protect these extreme expected populations to uh, warrant listing them as an endangered species. Though in China, they are considered a Class II native uh, national protection. But this protection level was waived to class one in 2021, so they are considered protected in China. And um, the main threat to these guys in China is things such as global warming, marine traffic, industry noise, ocean pollution, and poaching for aquarium precipitation uh, exhibits. Uh, in South Korea, they've also been uh, uh, protected. They're also second class endangered species, with people trying to protect them as well and try to protect them from being poached and things like that. So that's quite cool. Uh, another wonderful mod done by Leaf. We're going to see him dive, but that's okay. But yeah, really, really cool animal. Definitely do love these seals. So next up, last but certainly not least, also done by Leaf, we've got the Somali wild ass. So these guys are also known as the African wild donkey. Uh, these guys are a member of the horse, uh, the equid, and they are an ancestor to the domestic donkey. And they live in deserts and areas such as Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, Somalia, with the Somali wild ass obviously living in Somalia. Uh, they formerly had a much wider range into Sudan, Egypt, and Libya, but they are critically endangered, which sucks. In terms of size, these guys get about uh, 1.2 meters or about 4 foot tall and weigh about 250 kilograms, or about 600 pounds. Uh, the short, uh, smooth coat you can see is kind of light gray or a fawny color, which fades into a white underside with these kind of stripes along their legs. There's also a slender dark stripe within the subspecies, uh, dorsal stripe in the species and all subspecies though the nubian wild ass as well as the domestic donkey has a stripe across the shoulder as well which uh, the somali wild ass does not have the legs of the somali wild ass are also horizontally, uh, horizontally striped with black uh, stripes there you see almost like a zebra and um, on the nape of the neck there's also that really stiff upper mane uh, which is tipped with black hairs and the ears are quite large and the tail actually has a large black brush in the back as well with the horse having like quite slender hooves, which approximately the diameter of the legs. So quite interesting. In terms of taxonomy, as I mentioned, there's kind of two subspecies. There's the Nubian wild ass, which is found in the Nubian desert of Su uh, Sudan from the Nile River, the Red Sea, and the Somali wild ass living in Somali, Ethiopia, Somaliland, and places like that. And both are slightly different with, I believe, the wild, uh, the domestic donkey coming from the Nubian wild ass. In terms of these guys' habitats, though, uh, these guys live in desert areas. Let's have a look at the female here. Well, that's the male, actually. So the female is bigger than the male, of course. But we'll have a look at the male anyway. So um, 
In terms of these guys, they live in desert or semi-desert environments. They have quite tough digestive systems, which allow them to pretty much digest uh, dense ve uh, desert vegetation and extract moisture from that. They can go for wet water with a fairly long time, and they have large ears that are quite excellent for hearing and help in cooling. And because of the sparse vegetation, these guys live somewhat separated from each other, except for mothers and young. Unlike the tightly grouped uh, herds of... or herds of wild horses and they're also quite loud and they can be heard for up to three kilometers away which often keeps in contact with other members of their herd in terms of behavior these guys are primarily active during the cooler hours of the day like late afternoon and early morning they speak uh, seek shade after like rocky hills during the day they're quite nimble footed as well and um, they can move quickly across boulder fields in the mountains and on flat they've been recorded reaching 70 kilometers or about 43 kilometers an hour and um, in keeping with these feats, they are uh, soles are particularly hard and hooves can actually grow rather quickly. So mature males, they'll defend large territories of up to about 23 square kilometers in size and marking them with dung heaps, which is a great marker in like flat terrain. And due to the size of these ranges, the dominant male cannot really exclude other males, rather they're tolerated or treated as subordinates. And they're kept as far as away as possible from resident females. And in the presence of an estrus female, the males will bay loudly. And these guys will live in loose herds of up to about 50 individuals. Let's have a look at these cuties. So, um, in terms of the wild, these guys will breed during the wet season. And gestation typically lasts for 11 to 12 months. And um, one foal is born during October to February. Which is quite interesting. And um, typically these foals are weaned about six to eight months after birth and they will reach sexual maturity about two years of age. And um, I'll just kind of see if they want to do that social animation. They don't seem to want to. Anyway. Oh, they will. Okay, okay. So, uh, and typically in lifespan and captivity can be up to 40 years. They're doing it. How cute. And... Um, Wild asses are quite swift runners, they can run almost as fast as a horse, though unlike most hoof mammals, uh, they will actually stand and fight back in uh, d uh, potentially dangerous situations, they'll investigate and first decide what to do. So they've been known to defend themselves and kick with their hind and forelimb, uh, hind limbs. And equids have been used for pull chariots and things like that, though they have been suggested to be actually ognars, but now believed to be domestic asses. So in terms of diet, these guys typically will eat grasses, barks, and leaves. And despite being primarily adapted for living in arid climates, they are dependent on water. And when, uh, they are not receive, when they're not receiving the moisture from vegetation, they must drink at least once every two to three days. However, they can survive on a small amount of liquid, and they've been recorded drinking uh, salty or brackish water. So that's quite good for them. Though we're going to get to their conservation status, you could argue itself the species is not under threat because of the abundant domestic stock of donkeys. The two extant wild subspecies of the uh, wild ass are actually endangered, or the African wild ass, uh, because of interbreeding within wild and domestic animals that's caused to decline their population. Now believed to be only about a few hundred of both subspecies in the wild, with um, uh, them being hunted for both food and traditional medicine in both Somalia and Ethiopia. They've also been hunted for food, uh, as I mentioned. They've also been competition with livestock for grazing uh, in restricted areas to water, restricted access to water supplies because of agricultural developments, which actually threatens their survival. But luckily, they are legally protected in countries where they are found, although they're, it's often difficult to enforce them because they're so remote. And um, a protected population of Somali wild ass exists in Israel, which is quite good as well. And this reserve was established in 1968 to bolster populations of endangered uh, desert species, with population of horses and asses being friendly resilient. And because they, if they do get their protection and the help they need, they actually may recover quite well because they're quite adept survivors. Though they're also summer captivity, there's about 150 individual Somali wild ass in zoos, with about 36 being born in Zoo Basile. With the species breeding program started with there with the first wild asses in 1970, with the first birth in 1972. With the zoos and other um, European zoos are also managing a stud books. So they can breed them as well. And they're all descendants from either the original group at Zubasil or 12 others that came from the reserve, the Yorohakaban Nature Reserve in 1972. So yeah, really, really cool. And a nice mod done by Leith. This one's been a remake uh, from the one, original one Ivan did. And I've got to say, it really looks nice on the Przewalski's horse. Really, really nice mod. Definitely a big fan. 
So um, yeah, I think this is a great place to end the video. Everyone's really did a wonderful job with these mods. Really, really awesome. So um, yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified of anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye bye.